Hello, Afton. How is everybody doing today on this fine day here? So we're starting with our next chapter. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you is that this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, not, I'm still going to make these videos. That's not different. But instead of me giving you like, because we're going to be talking about this idea of rational functions. Okay. So rather than me giving you like, hey, this here's five problems, here's five problems, here's five problems. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just record all the videos, all the stuff on rational functions. Then on Friday, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to give you the entire day to work on some worksheets there. That's my goal. The reason I'm going to do that is because these videos are probably going to be a little bit longer than the previous videos. Now, you know everything like how long? I don't know. I haven't recorded it yet. But that's what I want you to bear in mind. So stick with me here. Okay. You might be like, oh, man, this video is going to be really long. Again, you will have a whole day where I'm giving you a chance to work on those problems. Now, at the same time, if you're like, no, I'm just keep, I like working a little bit at a time, feel free to jump ahead on Canvas and work on the assignment. It will be the Friday. It will be the Friday post. Okay, it will be the day four post. So just make sure if you have, um, I was like, this is going to be long. Buckle up. Okay, I'm just telling you right now, it's going to be long. But like I said, there won't be an assignment posted at the end of today. It will just be a worksheet at the end of the week. So with that in mind, rational functions. When we talk about rational functions, we're talking about something that looks like this right here. Y equals 1 over x. Now, just as a reminder, I could have easily just have written f of x equals 1 over x. Okay, y and f of x almost 100% the same. I was like, again, a little bit different. f of x is a little bit better, but I understand we're used to y. When I have 1 over x, okay, this is what makes it rational. Whenever I have x in the denominator, that's what makes it a rational function. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's take a look at what this graph looks like. So we'll start with our x, y chart, and we'll start with Mr. King's favorite points. Negative 1, 0, and 1. So when I plug in 1, 1 over 1, hey, that's simply 1, not a big deal. When I plug in negative 1, 1 over negative 1, well, that's negative 1. Here's where it gets interesting, because when I plug in 0, well, 1 over 0, uh-oh, I can't have that. I can't have 1 over 0. So by not being able to have, have zero, okay, that tells me that, sure, I got a point here, and I got a point here, but I can't, those, those definitely aren't connected because there's a gap in these numbers. So we're going to definitely have to take a look at some other numbers here. Let's take a look at two and negative two. Well, if I plug in two, that gives me one half. If I plug in negative two, that gives me negative one half. Typically, don't write your fractions like that, but I'm just going to go ahead and try to smoosh it in there. Okay, so, hmm, okay, well, let's plot those guys here. Two, one half, negative two, or, yeah, negative two, negative one half. Okay. Huh. That's weird. Well, the problem is that, again, if we kept going, or I'm not going to write it down, but if we kept going, I would have 3, 1 third, negative 3, negative 1 third, 4, 1 fourth, negative 4, negative 1 fourth. So I'd end up with all these tiny points here. Okay. Hmm. So I can see that as I'm extending out, my y values are just getting smaller and smaller. We need to know what's going on here. This is where things are getting kind of weird. So we need some numbers closer to zero. Well, let's go ahead and go completely halfway in between with a one half and a negative one half. So when I plug in one half, I'll have one over, one over one half. So one divided by one half, I multiply by the reciprocal and I get a two right there. So when X is one half, my X value is two. I can do the same thing for one over negative one half. And then in that case, we're gonna get a negative two. So negative one half, 
negative 2. And if I keep thinking about that, 1 third would be down here at negative, I'm sorry, 1 third would be here at 3, negative 1 third would be at negative 3, and so on. So, hmm, if I go ahead and I play connect the dots here and just kind of follow this along, I'm going to draw that a little bit better. Third time's charm. I'm going this way. There we go. We get a graph that looks like this. And a graph that looks like this. This right here is the parent function of a rational graph. So with that parent function of a rational graph, let's go ahead and let's talk about some things that are going on here. So we can see that I'm getting really close to that x-axis because right here, I have a horizontal asymptote. Misspelling. Specifically, my horizontal asymptote here is at y equals zero. But now if we look closer, I also have a vertical asymptote. Ah. I can't spell at the moment. I blame Monday, but you guys are watching this on a Tuesday. So. And in this case, I can see my vertical asymptote is at x equals 0. So with rational functions, typically we are going to have two asymptotes. We could have more than two asymptotes, but we are going to have at least two asymptotes here. There will always be at least one vertical asymptote. Now, like I said, some other crazy stuff is going to happen, and you're going to see that throughout the course of the next three days here with some of the weird things that you might encounter. But typically when we have this, this is what ends up happening. Now, I don't need to see an XY chart. I'm gonna paraphrase this down, I'm gonna pare this down, not paraphrase that, I'm gonna pare this down, and I'm gonna kinda of show us the nuts and bolts of what we need here, but I wanted you guys to see all the math that's going on. Now, I shouldn't say you don't need an XY chart, you won't need this elaborate of an XY chart, because I'm not gonna require that much detail on these graphs. The reason I don't require that much detail on these graphs is because this isn't even really that accurate. I mean, it's I'm not going to be able to be accurate. I'm going to be accurate on a couple points, sure. But, I mean, is this negative one-half two? I mean, is this two one-half? Did I perfectly get in the half? It's never going to be super accurate here. So that's what I said. I'm going to show you on this next problem exactly what I'm expecting from you guys when it comes to these problems. I'm going to tell you right now, I am expecting to see those asymptotes, okay? By the end of today, we should know how to find those asymptotes, no problem. I'm going to expect that your graph is located properly. We'll talk about location here moving forward. But that's what I'm going to expect from the graph. Now, I will also expect you to identify these asymptotes here. Just like we did last, just like we did on the last chapter where I said, hey, I'm going to want you to tell me where those asymptotes are. Hey, I'm gonna want you to tell me the domain and range. We're gonna to need to do the same thing on these problems as well. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and let's talk about domain and range. All right, this green here. So for my domain, what X values can I be? Or more specifically, what X values can I not be? Well, it can't be zero. I just realized how bad looking that X is. I can't be zero because that's where my asymptote is. So then in my domain, I can simply say it's everything smaller than zero, negative infinity to zero, but not including zero, and everything bigger as well. Just a little bit more room. And then for my range, 
again, I can be very, very low. I can be very, very high. I just can't be that zero. So my range in this problem is going to look the same as this right here. Negative infinity to zero union zero to infinity. So those are the things I'm going to expect you to identify. Identify any asymptotes, identify the domain and range. Now I'm going to tell you right now, if we can identify the asymptotes, we can use that to help us with the range. We're going to see that moving forward here. So let's take a look at another problem here. Okay, so we under if we understand that general shape, if we understand this idea of, hey, I'm going to have a vertical asymptote, a horizontal asymptote, and then it's going to be in some regions here. That kind of ties this all in together. All right. So to help us identify those vertical and horizontal asymptotes, which we'll just abbreviate VA and HA. I think those are the easiest ways to abbreviate vertical and horizontal asymptotes. For the vertical asymptote, I just need to think about, okay, well, that's going to be my restrictions on my X values here. So when I'm thinking about this, what X value could I not plug in here? What number could I not have in this case? And for this, when I look at that, well, if I plugged in negative 2 for X, negative 2 plus 2 gives me that 0. So right away that tells me that, hey, there's a problem going on around at or not around at negative two so then i know my vertical asymptote is simply going to be x equals negative two so i can go to negative two and again the reason that's a problem is because if i plug in negative two i get a zero in the denominator now for the horizontal asymptote we're going to come back right now i'm just going to tell you the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero Again, by the end of today, we will know exactly how to find that. Now, once I have those, once I have those, all I simply need to do is just go ahead and test the point. So I do need to make an XY chart. Again, not a big one, but I need to pick something on the left side of the asymptote. I need to pick something on the right side of the asymptote. So right here, if I pick something on the left side of the asymptote, I could plug negative three in. Just using negative three, again, just pick a number at random. We could pick negative four, negative five, negative a million. Doesn't really matter. But I plug in negative three. Negative three plus two gives me negative one. One divided by negative one gives me negative one. So that tells me that I have a point right here. Now, as long as we understand the curve of this graph, the shape of this graph, if you got that point right there, all I'm going to ask you guys to do is follow those asymptotes. I know it's down in this region. It's not up here because of where that point is. And then again, I can just follow those asymptotes. That's all I'm asking for you guys here. Because like I said, there's lots of crazy cases and stuff like that. I don't care about all those crazy cases. But I'm going to tell you right here, unless there's something really, really funky going on here, I was like, that typically is the shape of our graph. Now I need to test a point over here, test a point on the right. So I can go ahead and I can plug in uh, negative one or zero. I'm gonna pick negative one. The only reason I'm gonna pick negative one is because when I do that, negative one plus two is one. One divided by one is one. I always like to go just, just off of it. I just like to go one point off because when you start to get further, now you have to deal with fractions. And again, it's not that I'm gonna expect that point to be super accurate necessarily if it's not one of these nice lattice points here. But it's just a little nicer if it is. So again, I can see, hey, that means that part of the graph is going to be up here. So again, I can just follow these asymptotes just like that right there. Again, I'm not going to get too particular on this. I'm going to make sure that it's in the right location. Now, when I say the right location, that doesn't mean that you've given me this. Hey, no. It's one thing if it's if it's you yeah, accidentally drew it just underneath the asymptote. I can be like, right, you know what? That's just again. I don't expect you guys to rewrite that stuff. But when I see students doing this, 
we got a problem, okay? We need to understand that this graph is following those asymptotes here. So that's what it should be doing, is it should be following that asymptote. That's what an asymptote is. It's a line that we ultimately approach, but never reach. I'm reminding you of that definition from last semester. So that's exactly what's happening here. I'm getting really close to that y equals zero line. I'm going to be so close that it's almost indistinguishable between those two, but it's not quite there because one over a million, while really close to zero, is not zero. So we still need domain and range. So I still need domain and range. Again, last time I said I abbreviate it. Now, this is typically how I abbreviate domain and range. I want you guys to kind of abbreviate DOM and write range out, but really DNR is good. So domain, again, what X value can I not be? To help me with that, look at your asymptote. I can't be negative two. We already discussed that. So then I know my domain is going to be negative infinity to negative two union negative two to infinity. I can use those asymptotes to help me. And then for my range, again, I see, hey, y equals zero. That's the y value I can't be. So negative infinity to zero union zero, excuse me, to infinity. So things to bear in mind. Now, again, we can see that same information looking at the graph, just saying that we can already see the numbers looking at this right here. Questions? If you do, just uh, go to www. This is even though I recorded it live, you're not watching it live. Com, and then just email me. Uh, not from that website. Just email me from your Gmail account. All right. So let's take a look at this guy here. We got y equals three over two x minus five. Hmm. So what? X value can we not have? Hmm. If you can see it, great. And some of you guys can. Some of you guys can look at that right away and go, ah, of course I know what works and doesn't work. Looking at that, Mr. Keith, I already got it. Some of us might be having some trouble here. The nice thing is there's a very simple way to help us find the vertical asymptote. That very simple way to find vertical asymptotes, all we simply need to do is set the denominator equal to zero and solve. That's it, that's all you have to do. 100% easiest thing in the world. Simply go ahead and take that denominator and set it equal to zero. So when I look at this right here, I got two X minus five. So I can just take that two X minus five and set that equal to zero. And from there, I hope it's fairly obvious for us. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and add 5, divide by 2. And then I get x equals 5 over 2. And that right there is our vertical asymptote. That's it. That's all there is to finding these vertical asymptotes, is I'm just going to set that denominator equal to 0 and solve. Now, again, our horizontal asymptote, one more time, I'm going to tell you. You might be thinking, oh, well, Mr. Keith, there's a three up here. It doesn't change my vertical asymptote. It doesn't change my horizontal asymptote. Just a number up there, it could be a million up there. It doesn't matter. Changes the shape of our graph. Our graph looks a little bit different. But since we're not really stressing too much on it, we don't have to worry about that. So horizontal asymptote, one more time, I'm just going to tell you y equals zero. Again, by the end of all this, we will know how to find that horizontal asymptote. I'm just not worried about it right this second. So we can go ahead and start to graph those things that we just found. X equals five halves. That's 2.5 if you're having trouble thinking about that. Not a perfect straight line. I want a little zigzag there. Uh, and then Y equals zero. Yeah, a few side notes here when labeling these, because I'll get students label this incorrectly. They'll write down the 
y equals for the vertical asymptote, the x equal again. X equals our vertical lines, y equals our horizontal lines. That should be kind of obvious the way we write our answers, but I do just feel the need to say that. So now again, just a quick x, y chart here. I need something on the left side, I need something on the right side. Again, two and three sound like good numbers to me. So if I plug in two, that's gonna be uh, two times two is four minus five, negative one, three divided by negative one, we get negative three. If I plug in three right here, two times three is six, six minus five is one, three divided by one gives us three. Okay, so two, negative three, and then three, three, right there. So we can see where this graph is located. We can see, okay, I'm in that top right area here. I'm in that bottom left area here. Outside of that, I can go ahead and again, just play connect the dots. And by connect the dots, I mean, follow those asymptotes and just kind of make sure you're going through the point you found. Again, follow this guy. Now, what that three actually does is that pulls this line out a little bit. It's not as close to that intersection of asymptotes. It's a little bit further out because it stretches that a little bit further out. But here's the thing, again, when I have a million on the bottom, one over a million versus three over a million, it's uh, again, still pretty close to zero. So once I get out here, that top number, since it's just a number, really becomes a little bit irrelevant. So now from here, you can go ahead and find that domain and range. Again, use those asymptotes. Go ahead, hit that pause button or just try to be faster than me. Write down what you think the domain and range is and then we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at it together. Our domain is simply negative infinity to five halves union, oops, five halves, common infinity. That's it. Our range is simply negative infinity to zero, because again, that's where I still was, union zero to infinity. There you go. We've listed all the information I asked for. We have our graph. All right, so let's talk about this guy here. Hmm. Huh. Um, question, Mr. Keith. What are we supposed to do here? Well, what are we supposed to do here? I had said something. To find the vertical asymptotes, you set the denominator equal to zero and solve. It doesn't change. The thing that I said is true 100% of the time. I only ever give you guys things that are true 100% of the time. So right here in this problem, I can go ahead and I can say, hey, looking at this right here, I just need to take that x squared plus 2x minus 8 and set that equal to 0 and solve. Huh. How do I solve that? Oh, hey, I can factor. Man, it's almost like I should have told you guys we're going to keep using factoring the whole time. I can easily factor this down and get x plus 4, x minus 2. Set this both equal to 0. We're going to get x equals negative 4 and x equals 2. Write those separately. They're separate equations. Make sure you say x equals negative 4 and x equals 2. Too many times I have people write x equals negative 4 comma 2. That's not a valid mathematical thing to write. Don't write that. So those are vertical asymptotes. Now you might be going, well, there's two of them. Yeah. I didn't say vertical asymptote. Go back and rewind and look. I can click back, but I won't. Asymptotes, we can have many asymptotes. There's nothing that says we're only going to ever have one vertical asymptote. 
So in this case, x equals negative 4. I go right there. x equals 2. I go right here. Now, I'm doing this on a grid because I, I just pre-prepared these. It was easiest to do a grid. As long as I can see the negative 4 asymptote and the 2 asymptote, I don't really care if these are done on a grid or not. I was like, if we were in class, I wouldn't give you a I wouldn't give you a graph on the on the Hisler tests. Again, you guys don't really know what Hisler's are, um, but I wouldn't be giving you guys a graph. I would just be like, hey, just make a quick graph because I don't want these to be super accurate. I've said that I don't expect them to be super accurate. I should say because again, there's too many points um, that are just going to be weird. That again, there's no point in graphing. There's no point in graphing accurately. Let me rephrase that. So horizontal asymptote. Uh, this will be the second to last time I just give you the horizontal asymptote. Um, but again, there's nothing funky going on here with the numerator or anything like that. So our horizontal asymptote is just simply y equals zero. Now, what does this mean? Having two vertical asymptotes, what does that mean for our graph? Well. That means we're going to have three parts. I'm going to have to test some point over here. I'm going to have to test some point in here. And I'm going to have to test some point over there. So I still need an X, Y chart. Just now I am going to have three numbers. Again, something over here, negative 5 looks good. Uh, something in the middle, 0 looks good. And then something over here, 3 looks good. Again, I just pick some points at random. Um, if you're like, oh, but I think this point's better, Mr. Key. Cool. Now, you have an option. You can either plug it into this guy or you can plug it into this factored form here. Since these are exactly the same, it doesn't really matter which one you plug it into. Like I said, if I do negative five, I got it. If I do negative five here in the original, I got to do negative five squared and then negative five times two. And maybe you're like, oh, that's a lot, Mr. Mr. Key. Well, if I plug it in here, Negative five plus four, that's negative one, times negative seven, that's seven. Remember, it's still a fraction though, so that's one seven. Do you see why I don't care if it's accurately graphed? But if I plot negative five, one seven is up here, because it's still above that asymptote. I don't want to say above zero, I want to say above the asymptote. That's the important thing. Now, if I plug in zero, I mean, it, it, both are easy. It doesn't matter. Four times negative two, I get negative eight. I get over one, so negative one eighth. Negative one eighth is below that asymptote there. And then if I plug in three, that's going to be seven times one, so I get another one seven. So if I go to graph this, if I go to graph this here, again, I'm going to follow those asymptotes. So this guy right here is going to look like this. This guy all the way to the right is going to look like that. Now, I still need to follow these asymptotes. And I'm going to get close to this line right here. So. My graph is going to look something like this. Now, some, some students say, oh, it's a parabola. No, it's not a parabola. Don't ever call this part of the graph a parabola. I understand it looks parabolic. Again, you can use a simile here. I was like, but it is not a parabola because parabolas continue to extend out. This definitely has stops on the side. This has parts where, hey, we can't get any further left or right. All right. So now let's talk domain and range. Domain is always easy because, again, I can easily look at my vertical asymptotes. I see, hey, I'm getting close to this line. I'm getting close to these lines. I'm getting close to that line. Very easy to do domain. But now there are two numbers I can't be. So then I need to say negative infinity to negative 4 union, I can still be in between negative 4 and 2. That's this part of the graph right here. Union 
2 to infinity. The number of unions we have in our domain is going to be the same as the number of asymptotes, vertical asymptotes that we have. So keep that in mind. Now let's talk about range. Now, the thing to understand with range is that there's some point, there's some point right here, some A comma B point, where this graph is the highest. There is some point where we hit this maximum spot right here. So with that right there, it was like, we need to figure out that point. Now, I can tell you what that point is, okay? I can tell you what this point is in this particular problem. Right now, I'm gonna leave it as A comma B. I'm gonna do that for one simple reason. Because we're not gonna worry about actually finding that point. Because we could, mathematically, I could talk about, well, there's this and this and this and this and this, and, and in this case, you could do this, but in this case, you could do this, and, and it, here's why I'm not gonna talk about all that. Because the fastest way to find that point is calculus. This isn't calculus class. So I'm not going to worry about this point right now. The reason I'm not going to worry about that point right now is because, again, it's, it's not that it's difficult to find, just it's above our paper. So for this problem, negative infinity, comma, it'd be the B value. And we can actually get to that point. Union, zero to infinity. I'm never going to expect you to find that. Never, ever, ever am I going to expect you to find this here. Because, like I said, calculus is the faster way to find that. There are mathematical ways. Feel free to do some research. Show me the math on, on the test, and everything will be fine. But again, I don't expect you to find that. In this problem, I'd have to star by it, say, hey, I don't expect you to necessarily find the range. You can for extra credit if you know how. But like I said, outside of that, don't even worry about that. So there are going to be certain problems where, again, there will be a star next to the problem. And basically I'm saying, hey, don't worry about the range. If you also, if you try to find the range, like if you were to look at this problem and say negative infinity comma zero, parenthesis union zero to infinity, I'm not taking away points, but you just won't get any points. All right. So go ahead. I know we're, we're hitting the 30 minute mark here. And you're probably like, oh my God, is Mr. Keith still talking about math? Yes, I am. And I'm going to keep talking about math because we still have a handful more problems. Go ahead and hit pause. I want you to think about this problem. Try this problem on your own. See what you can come up with. See what you can think about here. Great. Now that you're back, let's take a look at this again. Find those asymptotes. Vertical asymptote doesn't change. You might be like, but there's a plus two over there, Mr. Keith. There's a negative up there does not change. Set that equal to zero, and we get x equals negative three. Now, for those who would say, well, is the horizontal asymptote, Mr. Keith, you still told us how to find that, is the horizontal asymptote still y equals zero? And it would be, except for this plus two. We talked about this back when we were doing our, back when we were doing our logarithm and exponential graphs. If I'm adding something after the fact, that is a vertical shift. That's going to shift this graph up two. Specifically, it's going to shift our horizontal asymptote up two. We don't see too many of these problems, but again, they are something that could be seen. So y equals two as our horizontal asymptote. If you got that part wrong, I, it's fine. I get it. That's one part that I would say. Okay. But just everything is shifted up two. So now we just do our little mini x, y chart. The nice thing is there's only one asymptote, so I need negative four and I need negative two. Again, I'm picking those ones specifically because I like being just off because when we're just this little bit off here, typically these numbers are pretty. So if I plug in negative four, I have negative four plus three is negative one. Negative one divided by negative one is one plus two gives me three. So I can see at negative four, I'm up here. And then at negative two, 
I plug that in, negative two plus three is one, negative one divided by one is negative one plus two, we get one. Now again, notice I'm below the asymptote. So that means my graph is gonna be below the asymptote. Ultimately, we see a negative there. Notice this graph looks different. And that can happen. There's various different ways that this graph can end up flipping, being in the bottom right and top left. That's why we have to test points. That was the point of this problem, no pun intended. And now domain and range. Hopefully, again, now that maybe you messed up on the horizontal asymptote, hopefully nobody messed up on the vertical asymptote. But hopefully with that in mind, you can go ahead and say, yeah, I got this, negative infinity to negative three, union, negative three to infinity for my range, negative infinity to two, union to two infinity. And hopefully you're starting to see that once you kind of get the hang of these, I was like, it's really not that tough to do these problems. I'm not saying there's not a lot to make sure you know, because now we're about to get into the idea of how to find those horizontal asymptotes. But again, once you kind of see these things and understand these things, it's not so bad. All right, so what can create an odd horizontal asymptote? What can create a different horizontal asymptote? Well, we saw maybe I'm adding something afterwards. That can move my asymptote, with my horizontal asymptote. So if I'm adding or subtracting anything in the very end. Right here, Anytime that I have something other than just a number in the top of that, anytime I have something other than just a number in the top of that, then yeah, that's where the issues can start to happen. So let's talk about how to find a horizontal asymptote. Now you might be going, man, that's a lot there, Mr. Keith. Yeah, it's a kind of complex thing. That's not to say that it's overly complex. That's not to say that it's not something that we can't understand. It's just something that we need to make sure that we get. So I'm stepping off the side here while I'm talking so you guys can see that. All right, so you need to compare the degree of the denominator with the degree of the numerator. Remember, degree is the highest exponent in a problem. So again, maybe you need to write that down, highest exponent. All right, so... When I look at this, if the degree of the denominator is higher than the degree of the numerator, the initial, I should put initial, horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Anytime I have that add subtract thing, again, this is only when I have one fraction. I should also be emphasized to. So right away, if I go back, I'm just going back a couple problems here. Right here, degree of the numerator. I don't have an x. My degree is zero. Degree of the denominator, that was one. So that's how I knew right away it was y equals zero. But here we can see, okay, that's not the case. All right, if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote. Some other crazy stuff is happening here. We will get into that again uh, later days here. If the degree of the denominator is equal to the degree of the numerator, then we have a very simple thing here. This is a lot of words for something that's very simple here, okay? Then the horizontal asymptote is y equals, we should know it's y equals, the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator. So whatever tells us those terms, whatever told us that yeah, they have the same term, or I'm sorry, the same degree and top and bottom, we just look at the coefficient of those terms. And then that's how we figure this out. So when I'm looking at this guy right here, I can see this guy, is, has the degree, this guy has a degree. They both have a degree of one. That would be the exponent on these. We don't typically write an exponent of one, but I will in this case. They both have a degree of one. So I know that they're the same. With all this, vertical asymptote does not change. Still set that equal to zero. My vertical asymptote is x equals two. For the horizontal asymptote, Again, now I have to look at that y equals. Now I'm gonna show all the details on this. I'm gonna show all the details, uh, but again, you can just jump to the end whenever you're doing these problems in the future. 
My leading coefficient here is the, again, the coefficient of this term. Well, I have a one here and I have a one here. So that means that this is going to be one over one, which we can simply write as y equals one. So there are our asymptotes, x equals two and y equals one. Now we can test some points. So I can plug in one and three, one and three. Now notice again, I have X in both the top and bottom. So I do need to make sure I'm doing that math here. This is going to be uh, four over negative one. So with four over negative one, that's going to be negative four. So one comma negative four is all the way down there. When I plug in three, that's going to be six over one, which is simply just six. So then three, six is up there. Again, now I know it's down here. I know it's up there. We should try to go through those points, but if it's not, again, perfect, it's not that big of a deal to me. Now again, there this continues to extend, but it does start to flatten out. You might be like, oh, well, that's kind of far away, Mr. Keith. Yeah, it does start to flatten out. Just it's gonna be really high in this problem. But that's generally what the shape, forgot my hair there, what the shape of our graph is going to look like. We still have that same curve. We spaced out. Now, you might be going, well, Mr. Keith, um, I, I drew my graph more like this. A little flat here for my taste, but if you're starting to follow that asymptote, I would say maybe, maybe yeah, I'm going to try that again. Maybe you drew it a little bit like this. Well, that doesn't look much different. Uh, Maybe you just didn't even really plot that point, and your graph just looks like that. I'm okay with that. Again, as long as the location is right, that's what I care about. That's ultimately, I would say on this one, this is where it's probably, you're probably going to do your graph more like that. And I would go, man, okay, it's in the right spot. That's really what I care about. Is, is, is it in the right spot? What I drew is slightly more accurate. I'm not overly concerned about accuracy when it comes to those graphs. Accuracy of the asymptotes, yes. The graph, yeah. domain. Again, hopefully we're starting to get the hang of this. Negative infinity to two, union two to infinity. My range, negative infinity to one, union one to infinity. If you have any questions on this stuff, like I said, I know I'm going kind of fast because I would like to keep this under 50 minutes. We still have one more problem to do. Uh, again, do not hesitate to email me. Do not hesitate to shoot me this email. Like I said, there's no assignment tonight. I appreciate you guys sticking around this long because I'm sure, I'm sure you paused and went and got a sandwich in the middle of this and I do not blame you one bit. All right, again, I need the vertical asymptote. I need the horizontal asymptote. Vertical asymptote, set the denominator equal to zero, subtract the one, I'm just going to write that. Subtract 1, divide by 2. X equals negative 1 half. Now, for that horizontal asymptote, again, where did my degree? Who has the highest exponent? Well, this would have the highest exponent, and this would have the highest exponent. Degree of 1, so don't just stress on that part too much here. I was like, now I just look at those leading coefficients. I see a 3 and a 2. So that means y equals 3 over 2. And again, it's fine. It's not a big deal. We have some fractions here. If they're written down and they're not perfect over here, that's why we write them down. 1 half is there. 3 halves is there. Let's get that location right. 
Uh, let's see, one and two look like good numbers to test, one and two. If I plug in one, that's going to give me seven over three. Now, seven thirds, you might have to pause for a second and think and go, okay, well, where's, what, what did I do? Why did nobody stop me? I'm a doofus here. X equals negative one half. Hopefully you guys were screaming at your screen as I was writing that. Y equals three halves. Right there. I can do negative one and zero. I was, man, I was doing the math in my head. I was like, this doesn't work. So if I plug in negative one, that's going to give me uh, negative three. So one over and then negative one here, negative two plus one gives me negative one. So I have one over negative one. Sorry, it looks like something carried over. One over negative one, which is simply negative one. So negative one, negative one, that's a zero. Man, it's a long lesson. I was like, so we can see that this graph is down here. And then if I plug in zero, that's going to give me 4 over 1, because again, those just become 0, 4 over 1. So that's just, man, hand work. 4. Again, that's the shape of our graph. Domain and range, we still need those. Look at our bird class, starts help us out. Domain. Negative infinity to negative one half union negative one half to zero. Our range negative infinity to three halves union three halves to zero. All right, I did it. We're just under the fifty minute mark. Now again, I appreciate you sticking around with me here. Because like I said, I thought this was easiest to kind of go through all these things in, in, in one sitting. So that way uh, we're good to go. The, the homework, especially today, I would say just kind of think about these things. Worry about the homework a little bit later. Don't worry about that right now. It's all posted. If you want to go look at it, that's fine. If you want to say, hey, I'm going to tackle as many problems as I think I can do. I think you can do uh, about a third of one of the worksheets. I don't even know if you can touch the other worksheet yet. But get that practice. Make sure uh, one of them was a worksheet I made so that way you can see like, hey, these are kind of how the questions are going to be worded. But in those directions, you're also going to see some other things that you're like, we never even discussed those. I have no clue what to do there, Mr. E. So, all right. On that note, I will bid you adieu. Until next time, stay safe out there, Afton. <laughs>